subscribe tag tv youtube channel and press the notification button tag tv us canada brings you news and views from white house and state department hello everyone the first duty of government is to protect the safety of our citizens. That's what Attorney General Barr said when he was here at the White House just a few days ago. For 55 days in Portland, Oregon, we've seen lawlessness, anarchy, and destruction that threatens peace in our streets and the safety of our fellow American citizens and the safety of our brave law enforcement officers. Yet some Democrats and some in the media continue to ignore reality. As Portland's, Portland's Democrat Mayor Ted Wheeler tweeted, quote, what I saw last night was powerful in many ways. I listened, heard, and stood with the protesters, and I saw what it means when the federal government unleashes paramilitary forces against its own people. That was a quote from the Democrat mayor who quite literally stood in the middle of a riot as violent protesters attacked a federal building. That is appalling, uh, and Mayor Wheeler's clearly failing at his duty to protect uh, his streets and his city there in Portland. The federal government has a sworn duty to uphold the laws of the United States through field offices and federal facilities across the country. These agents protect and serve the American people. Yet the rhetoric of the left undermines our justice system, with Nancy Pelosi calling them stormtroopers, uh, Jim Clyburn calling them the Gestapo, and Wheeler using the term paramilitary forces. Under President Trump, violent crime rates in America finally began to fall. Rhetoric like this cannot be allowed to set us back. Augmenting the Federal Protective Service, guarding federal property in Portland, our brave officers have sen since augmenting them, I should say, our brave officers have faced all of these various things like rioters barricading officers inside the Hatfield Federal Courthouse, trapping officers inside, a quote, commercial grade mortar firework was launched by rioters, a federal agent's hand was impaled by planted nails, another federal agent was shot with a pellet gun, leaving a wound deep to the bone, and tragically, three federal officers were likely left permanently blinded by the rioters using lasers pointed directly at their eyes. These are not the actions of so-called peaceful protesters, and the Trump administration will not stand by and allow anarchy in our streets. Law and order will prevail, and I have a short video for you because I want it to be real uh, what is happening right now in Portland. So if we could play that video, that'd be great. that is anything but a peaceful protest and this president will always stand on the side of law and order and with that I'll take questions yes thank you so much I want to ask you about the convention and then I have another question on foreign policy um, first of all has President Trump determined where he's going to or how he's going to deliver his speech he said he was working on that yesterday so he hasn't decided that just yet but we have a number of really creative exciting options that he's looking at it's a question more for the RNC but he's um, very excited about the prospect of what will come with the convention and I want to ask you about something that he tweeted back in April he said Joe Biden wanted the date for the Democratic National Convention moved to a later time period now he wants a virtual convention one where he doesn't have to show up. Gee, I wonder why. Does the president regret that now? Well, as you know, I can't respond to Joe Biden. You'd have to ask the campaign about that. Um, but the president, the circumstances changed in Florida where we intended to have the convention. As the circumstances on the ground changed, uh, the president um, changed his viewpoint on having the convention in Jacksonville at that particular location. I wanted to ask you about the president's phone call with Vladimir Putin. Did the president raise the issue of Russian bounties 
on the lives of American troops during that phone call? So as you know, that intelligence is unverified still to this day. There are dissenting opinions within the intel community. I won't get into the president's private discussions with a foreign leader. Um, I was not on that call, but that intelligence is still unverified. But rest assured, our president will always stand with our military and protect them against any and every foreign adversary. Yes. Yes. Nation, Kaylee, about what happened. He's been briefed yes. now, right? Yes, yes. thank you, Kaylee. Uh, thank you. Yes, uh, Nancy Pelosi and Mitch McConnell announced that John Lewis I'll will, come back to you next. Yeah. Will, will be lying in state at the Capitol Monday and Tuesday. Does the president plan to go to the Capitol to visit John Lewis on one of those days? I have no announcements about the president's upcoming plans, but John Lewis was a civil rights icon. Uh, we lowered the flag at the White House here um, to, to signify that. So I have no future announcements of the president's plans other than to make that one note. Yes. Thank you, Kaylin. Uh, so the Senate has approved uh, overwhelmingly a bill that would require the renaming of bases uh, that are named after Confederate leaders. How and how is it that Senator Inhofe uh, assured the president he was going to be able to remove that from legislation that has passed both chambers of Congress? Yeah, I'll leave that to Senator Enhoff as to how that works, legislatively speaking. But the president um, was assured by Senator Enhoff that uh, that would be changing and that Republicans stood with the president w on this and stood with the rest of America, 56 percent, according to an ABC Ipsos poll, are opposed to the changing of the U.S. base name. Kevin. Kaylee, thanks. Uh, two quick questions. Uh, I think you probably hear this often. When can Americans expect some money in their pockets by way of stimulus? What's the president's plan to get that money to them as quickly as possible? And just a question about COVID reporting. Uh, is the White House at all concerned about inaccuracies or inconsistencies with respect to COVID death reporting? So um, first, let me note, um, uh, when it looks at when we look at numbers, we want the most accurate reporting. Um, and I went through last week at the CDC numbers. We want to make sure hospitals are truly reporting um, all the information they're getting. Uh, one of the systems of data gathering, only 81 percent of hospitals were reporting into another HHS system was getting a more full picture of what we're seeing in hospitals. So we want to ensure all of our information is accurate. I um, mean, we trust the numbers that we're getting from HHS and CDC. I um, mean, with regard to phase four, um, those negotiations are ongoing. These are long and extended negotiations, um, but we feel that it's very important from the White House to address unemployment insurance in particular, um, and also money for schools and, and ensuring that uh, the money for schools enables students to make school choices like actually going to a physically open school. So right now that's where the discussions um, lie at the moment. One more quick one very quickly. Uh, drug pricing it is so critical to America's seniors. Uh, Often you hear terrible stories, frankly, about people having to ration drugs because of the incredible cost. What exactly practically can the American public expect the president to do to lower the cost of uh, prescription drugs? That's a great question. Um, the president today at 3 p.m. will be talking about drug pricing um, and he'll be announcing some actions he's taking on that front. So I'll leave it to him to announce those future actions. But, you know, in 2018, he released a landmark blueprint to lower uh, prescription drug prices. It's an issue he's been very passionate about, which is why he signed legislation ending the gag clauses that stop pharmacists from informing patients about lower drug prices and average, average basic premiums for Medicare Part D prescription drug plans have actually fallen by 13.5 percent since 2017. So he's done a lot already, but more to come uh, this afternoon, actually. Caitlin. I have two questions for you. This morning, Dr. Burke said that it is still an open question how rapidly children under 10 can actually spread COVID-19. But the other day, the president said they don't bring it home very easily and they don't transmit very easily. So shouldn't we figure out which one of those it is before kids go back to school? So let me give you two um, answers to this. You know, first, I would point you to CDC guidelines um, that said based on current data, um, the rate of infection among younger school children and from students to teachers has been low, especially if proper precautions are followed. There have also been few reports of children being the primary source of COVID-19 transmission among family members. That's where the data currently stands. Um, but that being said, even if um, there is trans mission and later studies come out, let's say, um, we believe that students should be going back to school because the effect on a child, we know scientifically, they are not affected in the same way as an adult. Um, again, I'd point you to CDC uh, guidelines on this that says the best available evidence indicates if children become infected, they are far less likely to suffer 
severe symptoms. Death rates among school-aged children are much lower than among adults and um, far lower than during the H1N1 pandemic, for instance, when schools remained open. Yeah, and Dr. Brooks noted that today, unless kids have an underlying condition, but she said they do not know how rapidly they can spread it still for if they're under 10. And that's one of the president's so, top advisors. So on the transmission point, I point you again to the CDC, but I would also say that it is our firm belief that the that our schools are essential places of business, if you will, that our teachers are essential personnel. You all here are considered essential workers, which is why you were coming into the briefing room every day during the pandemic. Our meat packers were meat packing because they were essential workers. Our doctors were out there treating because they're essential workers. And we believe our teachers are essential, particularly I pour over the, um, the data on, on schools often. And the one thing that really stuck out to me, I read through the entirety of the CDC guidelines, was that I talk about child abuse often and one in five cases being reported in schools. Well, the CDC guidelines went on to say there has not just been a sharp decline in reports of suspect, suspected maltreatment, but tragically a notable increase in evidence of child abuse when children are seen for services during the pandemic. For example, in Washington, D.C., Child and Family Service, Services Agency recorded a 62 percent decrease in child abuse reporting calls between mid-March and April compared to the same time period in 2019, but saw more severe presentation of child abuse cases in emergency rooms. That's a tragedy and our schools must reopen. Okay, my question yes. is about transition rates. But anyway, my second question is also on the president's that. call with the Russian president yesterday. Today, the nation's top counterintelligence official said that Russia is one of three countries that is actively working to interfere in our election. Did the president bring up election interference on the call with the Russian president yesterday? Again, I wasn't on the call, um, but the president, I was not on the call. Um, the president, but the president has taken more actions for election security than his predecessor, who gave a stand down order when he learned about election interference. Susan Rice gave that stand down order. Um, Obama's intel chief even confirmed that stand down order was given. By contrast, we've uh, given a number, a ton of funding to election security. We take our election seriously, question, and we believe president in election Trump integrity. My question Justin. is, did President Trump Justin. bring it up on the call? Justin, I was not answer. on the call, Caitlin. So Stop yes, filibustering. No. Justin, let your colleagues ask questions. Question. Justin, OK, have. Justin no longer has a question. Anyone else? Kaylee. Uh, Hi, Kaylee. OK. Around 20 million Americans are receiving ex expanded on insurance benefits, and some are going to receive the last of those checks tomorrow. Um, have Senate Republicans in the White House settled on a plan yet to extend UI? If so, can you explain what that plan is? And if not, did you wait too long to try to sort this out? Those Google? discussions are still ongoing, and I'm not going to get in the middle of the negotiation. Um, other than to say, uh, when I answered Kevin's question up here, I said that our priority um, right now is we feel it's very important to address extending um, those unemployment insurances. Um, and, and how that looks, I'll leave it to them. But that is unemployment insurance is a top priority for us and, right now. Uh, China ordered the closing of one of our diplomatic facilities there in retaliation for what happened in Texas. Um, we haven't really heard from the White House if you could spell out specifically why you guys decided to close the Houston facility. I know that there's obviously broad complaints that you've raised for weeks uh, with, with China, but why Houston specifically? And secondly, if you had a reaction to the steps China took. Yes, yeah, so our action to direct the closure of the PRC consulate general in Houston was taken to protect American and to, to protect American intellectual property and Americans' private information. Uh, for years, the CCP has undertaken a whole of society effort to steal American technology and intellectual property for commercial gain. And many of those activities are directed from PRC diplomatic facilities. And we urge the CCP to cease these malign actions rather than engage in tit-for-tat retaliation. So that's where we stand on that. Jeff. Okay, like the president's tone on the virus this week seems to have changed. He's uh, advocated a few different times for Americans to wear masks. He said that the virus would, or the pandemic would get worse before it gets better. Uh, he canceled most of the convention, or certainly the Florida part yesterday. All of these things were bad two months ago, even longer than that, and the science on masking has been clear for uh, several months. What changed this week? Why did his tone change? 
There has been no change. The President said on March 31st, before there was even a recommended but not required um, guidance given by the CDC on mask wearing, and the President already said, if you want to wear a mask, wear a mask. It doesn't harm anyone. And that was before. That was when our scientists even were, some of them were saying, don't wear a mask. So the President has been consistent on this. He wore a mask back at the Ford facility. Uh, he carries around in his pocket. He showed it to you multiple times. He hasn't changed. Um, in fact, and just speaking on COVID generally, um, the way I've heard him talk privately in the Oval Office is the way he's talking out here. The only thing that changed is the President taking dozens and dozens and dozens of your questions each and every day because he felt the best way to get information to the American people was for him to be out here um, answering your questions and providing this directly. The other part of the question, though, wasn't just about masking, although I would argue that if you look back and see when he called it politically correct, for example, that, that wasn't exactly agreeing with the science of wearing masks. But setting that aside, he no, but let's not set that aside, because in that incident when he used the words politically correct, it was in reference, I believe you were asking him a question, was it? And right, and you were standing outside and you'd been tested and you were wearing a mask and he couldn't hear your question, so he asked for you momentarily to pull down the mask. So that was the specific context, and context does matter here. Okay, well, I didn't need to engage on that, but I was standing around other reporters and using the same mic that other people were using. That's why I left my mask on. Right. Well, he could not hear your question. He asked for you temporarily to pull it down. Everyone in the press pool's tested. So scientifically, you are not in a compromising position. But he's, he hasn't changed his tone. Um, but this president, the reason he wants to bring back these briefings is to get information out there, like we've done 52.9 million tests nationwide, 187 emergency use authorizations, use, use authorizations excuse me, for test manufacturing, 20 million swabs per month, used the DPA over 20 times. All of these great successes of this administration, like distributing 31,000 cases of remdesivir, enough to treat nearly 200,000 patients. None of this is getting covered. And you've got the best messenger, the duly elected President of the United States, talking directly to the American people and getting extraordinary ratings as they tune in to get information but from my their question leader. Wasn't, yes, my John. question wasn't about John. that last piece. I just Thank want to you. clarify one thing, Kaylee. Okay, John no longer has a question. No, I Anyone do. else? I, do, I just Kaylee. want to John. clarify. Yeah. I, I don't want to talk over it. If, let, let me, if you don't mind, Jeff, maybe we can come back to you. I would like to finish my question. Yeah, well, yeah let, but the, let me, let when the, everyone in question. the front rows get five questions, people in the back row don't even get the opportunity to ask questions. Just that, that you're not answering the question. I want to ask about the Senate uh, Defense Authorization Bill, which passed by a veto-proof majority yesterday, and the House uh, earlier this week also passed their version of the defense bill, also by a veto-proof majority. And both of those bills contain mandates that the Pentagon rename these military bases, which are named in honor of Confederate generals. I want to ask you, does the President believe that his position, which we're all familiar with, it's helpful in terms of recruitment, it, specifically for African Americans? Explain how that position will help recruit African Americans in an all-volunteer military force. The President stands with the American people. 56 percent don't want to see the bases names changed. Where he stands is in a place where Many soldiers who have lost their lives overseas, the last ground that they saw were these bases. And by changing their names, he believes um, that, that it, it, is, it is not appropriate that those soldiers who lost their lives to be told that the ground I, I, I'm that they left. familiar with his position, I, and you just restated it very well. But I'm asking you specifically, how is this helpful for an African American which, who wants to volunteer for our all volunteer military forces? to go to a base that's named for a Confederate general that worked to still put and keep in place slavery, which impacted their ancestors. Because the bases are not known for the generals they're named after. The bases are known for the heroes within it, uh, the great Americans, black, white, Hispanic, of every race who have died on behalf of this great country. And 56 percent of the nation agrees with the president. So position that yes. it won't impact, it won't impact yes. then, it won't impact in any way Recruitment is what your position is. Next question. Uh, I've already that answered yes that one no? twice. It's just a yes or no. Kay Kaylee, I want to circle back to school choice, which you mentioned a few minutes ago. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that means shifting the potential for shifting federal funds away from schools that don't open so that parents can use it, use those funds for homeschooling, for private schooling. Um, the president vehemently opposes defunding police. Why, why is defunding public schools okay? 
So the president has never wanted to take money away from schools, take money away from education. It is about keeping it with the child. The purpose of school funding is to educate a child. The child, if a school is closed, loses the opportunity to receive education and needed social services. Uh, I put up the chart a few weeks ago from McKenzie and Co. Um, that showed that the, the student most impacted is the low-income student um, who's in a low-income community and doesn't have the resources as, of, as some other students. So that student should not not be deprived of an educational opportunity and forever never be able to recover um, the deficit um, that that child has had by being out of school for an entire year or more. The schools in those, in those underserved communities also are the ones that generally have terrible ventilation. Um, they need the most money for upgrading. If this money is shifted well, away from those schools, how will they ever get in, into a situation where they could, in the case of a, a pandemic, properly serve their population. Well, your question's a bit befuddling because if the problem is ventilation in schools and the schools close and you're fixing the ventilation, um, the student isn't even in the facility because the school isn't even open. The whole point is the student deserves an educational opportunity and a good educational opportunity, which is why the money must follow the student. And I would also note in the CDC guidelines that they said um, with regards to food in particular that there are 15 million children participating in the school breakfast program, 30 million in the school lunch program, and they said, quote, it is difficult to maintain this type of school nutrition program over the long term. And they were talking about how we've managed to get meal, service, meal services throughout the periods of school closures, uh, but they went on to say it's difficult to, to maintain this type of program over the long term. There are severe consequences. I've mentioned the child abuse, the loss in education, and also when it comes to nutrition services as well. Kaylee. Yes. Um, Kaylee, with the, pack, uh, the payroll tax cut uh, now off the table, is there anything that the White House considers a red line in uh, negotiations with Democrats and then also have another question. Yeah, there. I'm not going to get into red lines. These um, negotiations are ongoing, and I'm not in the middle of them, so I'll wait to uh, find out what the conclusions of those negotiations are. But I would just signal what I said at the top of this briefing about unemployment insurance being very important. And then um, President Trump called off the convention in Florida, citing safety. Um, does that give him pause for any of his future upcoming travel, like to Texas next week, which is a hot spot? We take all necessary precautions, um, and we protect the president, his staff, and we make sure that we're following the guidelines and social distancing, and so we don't have concern about future travel. Yes. Uh, the accusation that China is stealing intellectual property are not new, but, but, but why came this order to shut down the consulate in Houston I'm now, not, roughly yeah, I'm not going. days before the election? I'm not going to give any further information about our intelligence from the briefing podium other than to note um, what I told Justin earlier on that particular matter. Yes. Thank you, Kaylee. Um, on the question of reopening schools, yesterday, uh, just minutes after the President announced that he was going to cancel the uh, Republican convention events in Jacksonville, he also made the case again for reopening schools. So why is it not safe to hold the Republican convention, but it is safe to reopen schools? Yeah, the um, schools are a different situation when you have children who, um, as the CDC guidelines clearly note, um, are not affected in the same way as adults. Um, we can make certain arrangements like social distancing in schools and follow uh, the CDC guidelines that have been laid out um, and try to, they're the best world guidelines I referenced. Um, we can get our schools up to the, the best place we can get them in, especially if we're given additional school funding, the $105 billion that was mentioned that we would are keen to see um, in a phase four. Um, so so it's a different scenario when you have packed adults in the room versus these students that we can um, make precautions and take measures to protect. Yes. Thank you, Kaylee. I have a question about COVID, but first I want to ask about the use of federal officers. Does the president believe he has the power to send DHS to agents and officers anywhere in the country that he wants to? Uh, the president believes that his authority is in with regard to um, DHS, um, which is distinct from DOJ. There's Operation Legend, uh, which is primarily led by DOJ, and that's just providing extra FBI and ATF and DEA agents to already existing uh, places. It's just surging um, extra personnel in places that are out of control, like Chicago, for instance. Um, separate and distinct from Portland, which is DHS, and his power pertains to 40 U.S. Code 1315. I, I read that statute for you in the last briefing, so I won't bore you with reading it again, uh, but that's with protecting federal property. So those are the two lanes that we've um, acted on and look at. But for those DHS, those officers and agents, does he believe he has the power to send them anywhere he wants? Uh, he believes they're there to protect federal property, so I'll leave it to you to determine where's federal property. And just, just to follow up on that, I mean, has the president reminded those federal agents and officers that their constitutional obligation to not violate search and seizure rights and not take 
people into custody without probable cause? Well, Chad Wolf is leading this operation over at DHS, um, and he has made clear that uh, his officers are acting within the bounds of the law. Of course, we encourage everyone to act within the bounds of the law and the Constitution. He said he loves yes. the Constitution. We haven't heard Thank, him speak about that particular yes. part of the Constitution yes, um, in this context. President Trump has repeatedly said that he wouldn't watch sports or support sports if players continue to kneel. Um, so why has he agreed to throw out the first pitch at the Yankees game next month? If the considering that baseball players not at last night's games. Yeah, I'll leave it to him uh, as to address um, the Yankees game. He's very excited to throw out the first pitch, and um, I was not a part of the discussions as to um, how that's going to work in terms of um, the first pitch. I've learned about it when you guys did, and he's very excited to throw it out. Yes. Thank you, Kaylee. Two questions. We understand that the governor of Florida is on campus today. Can you confirm and can you talk about that visit? Will he be meeting with the president? Yes, Governor DeSantis is here. Um, he's here to be a part of the drug pricing event, um, but he will be talking and meeting with the president further to discuss COVID and other matters. A question okay, about COVID will they be discussing the convention? I, I had two questions, if you, if I may ask sure. the second one. Uh, this is why any, I like to save time for you guys in the back. So I appreciate so it. So I can get to you. Yeah. Yes. Uh, do you have any guidance on when the president will be signing that immigration order that he's been talking about? On yeah. DACA. Yeah, yeah, so um, no guidance um, other than to say I've, I laid out that he would have a mayor based EO and he really would like a legislative fix for DACA and would like Democrats to come to the table, but no guidance on timing just yet. Chanel. Thank you, Kaylee. Um, on federal law enforcement efforts, uh, mainly Operation Legend, we're talking about funding for a lot of these programs. Anytime we're talking about federal anything, we should be talking about the money behind it. Um, so with Operation Legend, it appears to be filling a law and order void in majority Democrat cities. So given this fact, um, in terms of the funding, would the citizen of, say, Springfield, Missouri, be called to pay for the security and the federal protections of the incompetence of Chicago, Illinois. Is that something that has been discussed as far as funding for Operation Legend? Um, I'm not aware of that being discussed in particular. I think where the president's head is at right now is, you know, you look across the country and it is Democrat streets where you're seeing a lot of this lawlessness. Um, in Minneapolis, murders have spiked 94 percent. Philadelphia, murders have spiked 27 percent. Over a year ago, New York City, 277 percent increase um, in shootings over a year ago. Chicago the most egregious, 414 people killed, 50 percent increase over a year ago. Um, we saw with under President Obama, violent crime started to tick up, started to come down under this president. He restored law and order. Um, and then this defund the police movement has been an absolute travesty. And it's why um, you have 67 percent of black Americans who worry that the criticism of police will cause police to pull back. So this president is looking at this um, in a saving lives lens. I want to save lives. I'll put federal money in, um, as he did. Um, financial assistance was announced with AG Barr um, and also additional manpower. He's um, very keen on, on seeing the violence in our streets end. Um, he wants to protect the people of this country when derelict Democrat mayors and governors do not. Um, and he's also appa appalled by cancel culture and cancel culture specifically as it pertains to cops. We saw a few weeks ago that Paw Patrol, a cartoon show about cops, was canceled. The show Cops was canceled. Live PD was canceled. Lego halted the sales of their Lego City police station. It's really unfortunate because I stand with, and the president stands with, the 63 percent of Americans who think police officers are one of the most important jobs in this country. That's 63 um, percent. And with that, I, Caroline Levitt, one of our great assistant press secretaries, um, today went to great pains to make contact with the South Hold Police Department in Suffolk County. Uh, we saw a very touching video that we loved, uh, and she got the approval of the police department and the parent to show this video because I think this is emblematic of where America stands with regard to our police. So if you wouldn't mind playing that video, that'd be great.
Thank you to our heroic police department around the country. America stands with you.